Hello, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, I especially want to thank everybody for being here because I know it's been a very busy time. Um, it's an understatement to say that, you know, it's been an unprecedented time on either side of the Atlantic. There's a lot going on. Um, coming back to the reason why I wanted to hold this meeting is uh, in two days, it'll be the 14th anniversary of the assassination of Quarantin. Um, I don't think I need to tell anybody who Turantin was, at least not in this group. And I just wanted to share, as you saw, one of my favorite quotes um, from him. And that is why I thought we could talk about dialogue um, and the benefits and the challenges that is involved in what dialogue means to people. And we have several uh, participants that are not just from Boston, but from outside of Boston that we'd like to hear from. Um, before we say hello and I give a proper introduction to our main guest, Vardubi, um, I want to say just a few housekeeping notes, okay? Um, very important, please mute yourselves until it is time for you to speak. Uh, which will be a little bit later in the program, you know, uh, in the Q&A or the discussion program. It's very helpful for us um, if you mute yourselves while uh, others are speaking. So that's one thing. The next thing is um, making use of the chat function um, for a couple of reasons. Um, if you have some uh, audio or vi video issues with this Zoom, uh, if you can't figure it out, I have my lovely young friend, Gina. Say hi, Gina. I mean, say hi, Gina. Um, I'm going to try to help us out. If you have any technical issues, she will, rather than me trying to keep up with what's going on, if you write your question or complaint in the chat, uh, Gina will try to help us. Um, the other thing about the chat, I thought that if uh, whoever wants to just said something very quickly, where geographically they're joining us from, it may be a good way to uh, connect with all of you. So feel free to use the chat and write down, um, you know, where you're joining us from. I think it's a helpful way to keep up the connection. Um, the other reason is that I do think that maybe later also as the program progresses, if anybody wants to say something about um, themselves or some other group that they know that they're affiliated with or not, that are doing any kind of dialogue work. Um, at the end of all of this, we will make a copy of the chat and then I can send it to whoever is interested. So people can know other initiatives uh, that may be similar to what they have uh, done in the past. Um, uh, the next thing I do want to um, mention to you is that um, in terms of transparency, I'm gonna say just a few short words about who I am, just in case some of you do not know who I am. So my name is Gonja Sun Mespool. I've been working and living in the United States since 1978. I know that's a very long time. Um, and I've been uh, living in this area, mostly working in television, uh, doing uh, video stories, television production and documentaries. Um, between uh, 1991 and 1993, um, I had a short time, two years, that I lived in Istanbul with my young family. Since then, I have returned here. Um, uh, in uh, between 2014 and 2016, um, I started a group, a very uh, grassroots group of Turkish and Armenian women called Turkish Armenian Women's Alliance. It is no longer uh, officially a meeting except that a few of us except that a few of us have um, become lifelong friends. Um, and the, my involvement with Turkish Armenian relations go back to the summer of 2006 um, and I've done different things um, since then in different capacities. Now, the most important part uh, right now is that I want to say a few words about our guest from Istanbul, Barduri, and we thank her for being with us because I know very well there's been a lot going on in Istanbul because of the time that we're living in, and thank you for uh, making the effort to come and be with us. 
Um, even though it's hard to you know, put one's life in a paragraph, I'm gonna try to do an introduction and then we'll talk to her more, okay? So Larduhi Balyan was born in Armenia to a family recently migrated from Shamkir, Soviet Azerbaijan. After graduating from Turkish Studies Department of Yerevan State University, she moved to Istanbul, Turkey, where she is currently based. She earned her master's at Istanbul Bilgi University with an MA thesis on Turkey-Armenia normalization process and the role of civil society. She's been working as a journalist and coordinating various projects at civil society organizations. Some of the main topics she's been covering are conflict resolution, minorities, human rights, democratization, memory. And believe it or not, um, doing films also, she has found the time. Um, and I hope that all of you have been able to uh, watch her short film, Dialogue in a Basket. Um, which brings us to our conversation. Um, so one of the things that I know about Duhi as far as somebody who's been in the world of telling visual stories is that everybody, you can do a story about anyone. It depends on how you're gonna do it and how you go about it. So, which is why when I saw Dialogue in a Basket, I thought it was quite um, unique. So. Um, tell us a little bit about how it came about, how, how you decided to do it. I know it was during the pandemic lockdown when I think older people couldn't leave their homes except for a few short hours or something, but tell us about that. I uh, would love to hear from you. And welcome and thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much for initiating this and for inviting me and thanks everyone for sparing your time to watch the documentary and also being here. Um, yeah, uh, Gonja told almost everything about me. So basically I was born in Armenia and, I, and then I moved uh, to Istanbul. I've been working mostly in uh, different NGOs uh, in right-based um, projects, uh, like uh, rights of different groups. And, um, and also I have been involved in Turkish-Armenian normalization process, like whether being like one of the organiz or organ um, like uh, in the organization group or as a participant or you know, uh, just being there, like um, within Ranting Foundation, within uh, Community Volunteers Foundation, which is um, uh, the largest youth organization in Turkey in the beginning. And then it uh, went to more uh, like academic sphere and my thesis for, was uh, on this topic. So my, I myself consider this um, documentary as a, as, a, as a dialogue project, but um, a more a more realistic one uh, with a like real person and not uh, lasting for a week and like um, we have in many projects like uh, you come together uh, for a week and then as if everything is okay as if uh, the dialogue is set and everything is uh, perfect um, and then we split sometimes being in touch and sometimes not so um, the pandemic in Turkey, as many of you most probably know, was really harsh. I mean, in means of the um, restrictions, there were uh, lockdowns, uh, mostly for four days uh, involving, like including the weekends. And in general, people over 65 could not leave their places. It was just um, almost once a month on Sundays, they could leave as uh, you also saw in the, in the documentary. Um, maybe I should start, speaking a bit about our relationship with Fatma Teze. Um, I mean, we live in Kurtulus, as uh, if uh, there are people who don't know, it's a multicultural and multi-ethnic ethnic, uh, place uh, where, I don't know, all the minorities almost live. Um, uh, she's from Erzincan, like she's Turkish, at least this is how she uh, introduces herself. And um, when I first moved there, it was just a normal, like a neighbor, neighborhood thing, like a young lady living alone. And uh, of course, uh, them living there in, in the apartment, like for 50 years. And then that hierarchy came. Uh, so it was like a, just a classic uh, neighborhood uh, thing in the beginning. And uh, of course, with the rush in Istanbul, being a big city and also having a lot of work to do, you usually don't come across with her or your other neighbors. So it was just, you know, small chats. And like um, we got to know each other, especially when my mom was here and she was trying to speak to her and all my uh, guests uh, from Armenia, even though they had no mutual language. Um, 
So during the pandemic, we had a lot of time. I mean, Fatma Teze and me, and at the time we were spending in the balcony. So this is how basically our connection got stronger, like really strong. Uh, I was spending uh, vast, the vast majority of my time with her. So when I decided to somehow uh, document my isolation, I, I realized that my isolation was Fatma Teze and uh, my relationship with her that was evolving and changing. So this is how we started the shootings. Um, as you may uh, have noticed, there is uh, the logo of Chai Hana, which is an initiative uh, based in Georgia and run by women. Uh, they work on different topics in um, South Caucasus uh, and they had this open call on isolation. So I decided, okay, I'm gonna write this synopsis and send it uh, to them. And I did, it got accepted. And then just after that, I told Fatma Teze, okay, so there is this idea of shooting our isolation and our pandemic, what would you say? And she was happy. Uh, I guess I knew she would be happy. That's why I didn't uh, ask her uh, before that. But of course there was the risk that she wouldn't agree. And uh, this is how we started uh, shooting, um, you know, our lives, basically our chats. Uh, but uh, we had this settled sh schedule, like, you know, uh, we, we chose a certain time of the day, like from four to five, when the sun is not there on the top and the light is perfect. And also we were choosing the total lockdown days, like uh, weekends. So um, everything that you see in the documentary was shot during the lockdowns. And basically, this is why uh, there was no one uh, to help me with the shootings or to be there for her for uh, shopping or for anything else. It was just uh, her husband. So uh, it, it was the idea for us to be just two of us uh, and Ali Amja as, as far as uh, he wanted to be involved. Um, so this is how we started shooting it. And then the rest evolved itself, uh, as you could see. I mean, maybe I can explain the rest uh, with the questions if you want, or, you know, I can speak because I like speaking. So maybe I should stop here and then yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yes, that's wonderful. I just want to ask before we go into the uh, participants, um, a couple of things uh, that I want to ask you. Um, were there any uh, areas uh, or anything that um, surprised you coming from Fatma Teze while you were doing the filming? Um, anything that came as a shock or surprise or maybe something expected, but you weren't really sure. So maybe you can elaborate on, on that. Yeah, well, there were many, many things. Uh, I guess this documentary and the whole procedure of the shootings uh, helped me uh, getting to know Fatma Teze. I realized that I haven't known her, like uh, almost nothing about her. And uh, the more I got to know her, the more I realized, um, uh, you know, things like, for example, why couldn't she um, uh, call my name Vartuhi as it is or Vartuhi? Yeah. So uh, then I started realizing this because she, 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 she doesn't know how to read and write even her name. Uh, so, I mean, this, this explains uh, everything about this. And then like, um, um, I've learned a lot about her, I guess. I mean, I, I like the whole procedure of this and um, maybe I should, uh, I, I wanted to, I would like to share this as well. Uh, in the beginning, I was uh, uh, skeptical, like really skeptical, whether I should do this or not, whether it was ethical or not, where I was standing. Uh, was I just um, someone who is interviewing her as like a journalist because I didn't want anything like this, just, you know, to put the camera and then ask questions to her. And then it, it evolved uh, and she herself, like she asked me, like, I also want to ask you questions. So this is how she got the camera. Basically, our deal was uh, when she gets the cam camera and it was her first time ever to hold a the camera, then when she can see me in the small screen, she can ask me questions. And this is how it turned and uh, it became like a mutual documentary, let's say. It was, it was not only about her, but it was also about me and our coexistence in that small apartment in Kurtulus. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess that was the, um, the biggest thing, me learning that uh, she, she was not able to read and um, she was, I mean, there were uh, a lot of information that was not in, uh, included in the movie, of course, otherwise it would, it would be like uh, way too long. Uh, she's facing a lot of problems here, being a Turkish woman, a Muslim, which is, uh, as, as, I mean, for a, a pro-governmental person, let's say, which uh, for many of us is um, what we call white Turk, 
especially if that's a male, but uh, she is facing a lot of problems in her daily life. For example, going to a grocery a market, like gro grocery market, pazar as we call it, like she, she, she said uh, that she was not able to learn the prices of, of the fruit or vegetables. And when she was asking, the guy would tell her like, oh, uh, just check it, Teze. So it, and this is just a small part, you know, when she's discriminated in the society. And I was just, you know, getting to know all of this. And I was surprised, uh, to be honest. Um, was there anything about you being Armenian and her being a Muslim Turkish person? Uh, that's something that came out during the, your filming that um, surprised you at all, related to your ethnic background? Well, not really. I mean, uh, she knew that I was Armenian. She knew that I was uh, not really a believer, that I don't pray, I don't go to church. Even she was asking me, like, uh, she asked me once, like, uh, so you don't even believe to your God? you don't even go to church like and I was like yeah well not not really and uh, that was really surprising for her and um, she knew that I was Armenian all the time and she, she she's she has no prejudices against anyone I guess she has all these stereotypes like you know in the background while saying like oh she's Arme she was Armenian but I really liked her that but mm -hmm. I mean which is explaining everything in the society of Turkey uh, but she's like open-minded, like uh, you would not guess, just, uh, you know, having a glimpse on, at her. She's, uh, she's super open-minded, she's uh, super um, warm, talkative, like communicative, she makes friends, and she's, she's really great. So we had good relationship. I mean, of course, we had um, uh, arguments as well uh, of her, you know, uh, how you call oh, yeah, it. Oh like, yeah, the rugs, right? She was like cleaning and <clears throat> yeah, she told me once that she's um, she's obsessed with cleaning and she cannot, uh, you know, stop it. So I was like, okay, so it was all compromises from me, from her, from me, from her. And then, uh, you know, this is what neighborhood is. So, yeah, I remember you told her that with the pandemic, because you were spending so much time more indoors, that you started cleaning and you started to appreciate why she may be a clean freak, right? So <laughs> I remember that. Um, before we go further, because I know people have questions, I, I do want to ask you just one little other question personally about you. Um, you know, you've been living in Assemble since 2013, I believe. Um, is, is there anything you would like to add about, you know, um, both personally and professionally, um, any challenges you have in your life living there in Istanbul and any regrets for making the move? Um, aspirations for the future. I know it's a big one, but I also know that you can, I've heard you speak, so you can say that in just a few uh, short minutes, maybe. Well, I mean, it's not really common for, for an Armenian from Armenia, you know, to just decide to move to Turkey. It was, of course, it was a decision with, um, I mean, it was a reasonable decision because I studied Turkish studies or, or Turkic studies, as it is, as it is called. Uh, so it was pretty reasonable to move here first uh, to work with the Hranting Foundation and then do my master's. Um, but of course, it's not common. Um, I mean, it's common if you come here as a um, labor migrant, uh, because this is uh, one of the countries that um, especially women from Armenia uh, move in, um, you know, um, because of econo economical uh, problems and crisis. But mine was more a decision just I came here but I was not expecting me to stay here for seven years if you ask me I was just no 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 I will be there for a year do this project and then I will go back because uh, my, my my master's at the, uh, the American University of Armenia was waiting for me as I was telling people uh, because people kept tell, telling me that you know Istanbul is an addictive city etc but I wouldn't believe I would be here like in uh, seven years so this is uh, how it's um, <laughs> what it is like uh, this is what I have now I mean people ask me uh, not uh, I mean everyone is asking me especially like everyone from Turkey is trying to move uh, outside of the country especially people who work um, mm, on human rights or in rights in general uh, and I, I, I barely call myself a journalist because I we don't really do journalism here it's basically with all the censorship here it's um, I wouldn't call it that way. 
but yeah, it's not easy with the current situation, let's say, but there are stronger things that keep me here. And mostly it's like about people, not about Bosphorus or not about Istanbul being a great city, but mostly people here. I, I hope it, I mean, I answered your question. Oh, you, did. You, did, you did answer it. Um, somebody um, uh, wrote in the chat. And so let me just address that. I guess somebody wants to make sure that everybody introduces themselves and have their videos open. I know one person who may be off on their video that happens to be my son. Um, and, and, you know, his name is Barish Pool. He's probably multitasking and, you know, doing something else in the interim. Other than that, I cannot see who else has videos off, but that was just something that was in the chat. So um, unless there is a very specific reason, um, I guess we'd love to see everyone's faces. So that's all I have to say about that. Um, and with that, um, oops, um, and with that, I'd like to open it up to uh, all of the participants. Um, and I'd like to first just find out if anybody has questions um, about the film or about Fadruhi herself or... Um, May I speak, Konja? Please. Yeah. Please. Oh, yes. Can I ask first? <laughs> okay, my wife... Please. Demands please. To turn, so I, I have no option but yield. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Vartu. I really like your documentary. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And we were living uh, in that neighborhood uh, just four years ago. So, <laughs> and uh, actually, my question is uh, I was wondering how was your communication uh, during the war in Karabakh? Did he make any comment or just nothing else is going on? Yeah, I knew this question was coming. <laughs> so, yeah, um, so I will go back slightly. Um, one and a half years ago, I guess, we happened to speak about Karabakh. And then I realized that her and her neighbor, they knew nothing about Karabakh, about Azerbaijan, because uh, her neighbor, who was her close friend, and of course she was introducing her to me, she was sitting there, she was like, you know, my, my son is getting married to a girl from Azerbaijan. And also we started speaking and she was like, when she comes here, I will introduce her to you because she's the same age. And I was like, oh, well, okay, good, of course. I mean, you can come for over for a coffee. And then we spoke about this. Then I realized that neither Fatma Teze nor her uh, friends from uh, next building knew anything about Karabakh. Mm -hmm. So basically it was all what she got from the TV and it was awful, it was harsh. <laughs> I mean, I can, you can imagine what was, I mean, if uh, the source of information during those days was uh, the TV and this uh, mainstream media, that was like really awful. I couldn't even watch it for a second. So uh, we never really spoke about it. And I should admit that for, for the first time in my life, I, 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 had kind of, I was kind of skeptical of uh, going to my place and staying there all alone. So I was staying at my friend's place for around a week, maybe five days, or uh, going to my place and staying with a friend. So she was curious, like how I was. She was asking me like, how are you? I haven't seen you these days. How are you? How, how is everything? It was because she was hearing all of these, you know, stories and stuff and war. I mean, because she's watching TV all the whole day. And, uh, but it was never like, um, she was like, I, once she said that she understands that it's hard, but I guess that was the, um, the only direct or indirect uh, reference to the war. But she was like really asking me how I was like every day, even called me once from Ali Amja's phone um, uh, to check on me. But uh, we never spoke about, uh, about it. And uh, I know that she, I mean, her relationship with me is uh, really personal. And uh, I tend to think that, you know, this personal relationship in a way is stronger than the state policy and the main media information that she's, uh, mainstream media information that she's getting. So it was like this. I mean, she was showing her solidarity and support and, um, you know, asking what she could do. But I guess that was the only direct uh, reference to the war and not even mentioning the war. Um, yeah, I guess that was it. I mean, we never spoke about it. And um, at that time, I found out that I have a huge crack on my wall. So I was already thinking of moving out. And then I finally did. 
So it was um, it was messy situation in general, and she was curious about me all the time. But yeah, we never spoke about the war. Uh, yeah, I think my question is a kind of continuation of this. But before, thank you, Johannes. I don't want to interrupt, but I've been getting uh, a little request. Can people who are going to be speaking during this session say a few short things about themselves? It would be helpful. I can, you know, because half of you do not know each other uh, in this group. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm on Neskluchta. Uh, I'm an academic. Uh, I mean, it's a long story uh, on that part. Uh, I'm a columnist in August newspaper. Uh, and hi, everyone. And, and first of all, I want to thank Gonja for making us meet and organizing this event. Uh, I mean, Varty, I like your work very much. I think it's a very uh, powerful documentary. And it's, I think it, its power comes from its simplicity and sincerity. I think we what we saw is the most uh, sincere and the natural, let's say, quote unquote, natural uh, version of a dialogue. Uh, but I, what I wonder is, as I said, the continuation of my uh, Tulai's question, uh, because you know a dialogue is not tested unless parties speak about difficult questions. Otherwise, it's it's difficult. It's easy to talk about daily things, uh, drinking coffee together, etc. I mean, this is valuable. I do not deny it. But as I said, a dialogue should be tested with with difficult questions and with difficult subjects. So, based on this, I wonder if you have, other than what we saw in the documentary, you, if you have further conversation about. Armenians or non-existence of Armenians, annihilation of Armenians or whatever genocide. Uh, so because she mentions uh, the existence of Armenians, but even before he was born, she was born, sorry, she was born. Uh, so I wonder if you have any conversation that we didn't see about this quote unquote non-existence or evaporation, let's say, of Armenians. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for, for the question. Uh, it's really nice to hear this from you, Johannes. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I guess um, facing the past is important, of course, and, uh, and speaking about it. Um, as, I, um, as I said in my previous uh, you know, answer, uh, it was never too direct, but it was always there. And uh, we always spoke about Armenians living in, in uh, Erzincan. Uh, but uh, it, it, there, there are like footages for, I don't know, an hour or something, or Armenians living in Kurtulush before, like in, in, in 70s, in 80s, when, as she said, it was still a forest. Uh, I mean, that part of Kurtulush at least. Uh, and uh, she, she told me once that there was an old lady uh, living in um, Erzincan when she was still a kid. Uh, she told me, you know, details about her and she was like, yeah, but she was all alone because everyone else had to leave. And she, she's not really aware of this uh, discussions of genocide or massacre or, you know, this like she is not really um, uh, aware of this political level of this discussion. But uh, surprisingly for me, she, uh, she never escaped this conversation and she was always the one to bring it uh, in. She was always the one to speak about Armenians in Erzincan. She was always the one to mention them and to say that they had to leave and then speak about their cemeteries in there and then say, oh, you know, they're digging there because there is gold buried in there. So, you know, this and uh, my uncle used to protect it, etc. So there are like many stories like this. Uh, but as it was not on this, I mean, I didn't really use all of those materials uh, in the, in the you know, documentary. But uh, so the confrontation with past and uh, and this like uh, Turkish Armenian issues, it was indirect, but it was always there. Her being from Erzincan, being covered, if we could uh, call it this way, and being uh, the uh, the part of society that usually uh, many of my friends or people around me would not really get involved with like, you know, really being a neighbor, or they would approach with a huge prejudice. She, uh, I mean, she proved not to be 
uh, what those people, maybe at some part of my life, even me, had in their minds. So it's not only uh, us not directly speaking about genocide or discussing and arguing whether it was a genocide or not is because she is not really aware of what is genocide, the G word bringing, and what is, you know, uh, uh, when, when you call it a massacre, what does it bring like legally or historically? But she was always speaking about Armenians. And I don't really think that any of her neighbors, uh, like uh, many of them would do this. And uh, she was always open about this. And she knew that she's having this uh, connection with me, this relationship with me as, uh, with, as, as an Armenian. Like she knew that I was an Armenian in front of her like uh, and um, and she was always like you know introducing me to her friends because you know this uh, I mean this is the, just uh, almost the end of Kurtulu so so it's like uh, economically not the same uh, like with the first island as we call it in Kurtulu and uh, they sit in front in, in the front door like in the evenings you know with their friends you know with the flower seats uh, cola coffee whatever it is and to chat this was really weird for me in the beginning and then I realized it was their only social sphere. And she would always introduce me to her friends, saying what kind of uh, nice neighbor I am, where I am from, what I am doing, et cetera, et cetera. So she was really open about this. And I don't think, I, I think it's uh, something brave, <laughs> to be honest. So even if this conf confrontation was not really direct because um, it was not on purpose, let's say. And also I, I, I would like to add this, as I said, I, I consider this as the best uh, dialogue project ever I have been involved, like ever, because uh, we always have these pink glasses that we, oh, of course, it's done. We have this dialogue, like uh, five uh, young people from Turkey, five from Armenia came together of their friends. They spoke about genocide. They accept it, and that's it. No, but I mean, this dialogue is not finished. This is unfinished dialogue. It's continuing. We are still in touch. And it's not giving you this, uh, you know, utopic uh, happy end uh, at the end. Because I mean, if you if you even I mean, look at the uh, metaphorically. I mean, not directly. She's still not able to pronounce my name. So it's still a process. <laughs> Let's call it. Um, thank you, Vardu. Actually, that's a perfect transition to what I think I'd like to do. If everybody uh, agrees is that to open it up to other people who have been in other initiatives, because you mentioned, um, hello, Binnaz, a star of the film Dialogue in a Basket. I saw a little piece of Binnaz there, thank you. Um, but I did, I wanna go back to something you said, because I think that'll open up a discussion uh, for other people in the uh, or audience. You mentioned that you value the personal relationship, obviously you had with your subject more than in the official relationship that we are encountering here, there, everywhere. So I'd like to find out if there are people in the uh, audience who I know more than a few of you have been in other initiatives um, about Turkish Armenian and or maybe Turkish Armenian and other uh, minorities from Turkey type of um, workshop or uh, dialogue uh, uh, workshops or um, attempts. And so I'd like to know what other people think about the value of having a personal relationship that supersedes the official one. And if you've actually been able to get any um, benefit of that after the initiative was over or if it's continuing. So um, I'd like to have other people also um, ask questions, whether it's related to our duty or film or other um, initiatives that you've been involved in. And I? Hello. This is Flora. OK. Yes, Flora wants to say something. And Flora, say something about yourself quickly, please. Yeah, I will. I did already introduce myself on the chat, but I've been part of the Bay Area um, dialogue group, even though I moved to the East Coast. But now with COVID, we're meeting on Zoom, so I could rejoin. And I just wanted to say to Vibruhi, I think there are other models of dialogue and this group's been going for 13 years. So it's not a one shot thing. And I've been in it off and on now for like nine years. So, um, and it definitely has evolved in a lot of ways and the relationships have evolved, but also, uh, you know, the willingness to risk and 
And one of the highlights for me was on the 100th anniversary of the genocide. This was at uh, the San Francisco commemoration. We went, we were together there as a group. So that was really impressive. But I had a question too for you, if I can ask that. And I wanted to know if she, Fatima saw the film and what she thought after the film. And, and behind my question is, yes, you two had a relationship, but I think for real dialogue, uh, there needs to be a critical consciousness that comes into play. And I didn't see that happening. Um, but I don't know if it happened later, like maybe if she, after she saw the film. So that's a question I would pose. Yeah, thanks for your question and for your uh, points. I didn't mean that the rest of the projects are not important for me or are not real. Of course, they, I mean, I have been involved in many amazing projects. My friends Typhoon Balchik and Fatma Bulas are here. I, I hope I will, uh, I mean, we will have time uh, for them to speak about an amazing dialogue project. We are still in touch. It's an amazing dialogue project they are running in, in The Hague, in the Netherlands. And um, so there are many projects I believe in. Uh, what I meant, uh, maybe I miss, um, uh, I, I couldn't explain myself properly. Uh, it, it was, this is something that is continuing and there is no illusion of it being uh, done, being finished and the illusion of this dialogue being accomplished. I didn't want to give this impression. I didn't want to give this illusion because there is none, because it's still continuing. Um, I could make this movie uh, more political and then you would maybe um, uh, see more of her speaking about political situation in Turkey and you would be surprised to be honest like uh, about Gezi protests about um, Armenians about this that, but I didn't put this on purpose uh, because um, it's only uh, us maybe and people around us who are aware of these kind of political situations here. What I wanted to show was uh, the personal stories, which is pretty political, if you ask me. Uh, her making uh, connection with me, her make, being in touch with me, her putting effort uh, to be a neighbor with me is also political. I mean, at least this is how I, um, I mean, comment. I mean, this is my view, of course. But um, I, I don't really need her to be politically involved in any ac activity or um, be that aware to consider this as a dialogue. I mean, this is my, uh, I mean, back then I, I used to think this way, but now it's um, because this relationship itself, it's pretty political. Uh, I mean, that's what I think. And uh, if I go back to this Karabakh war uh, and those like harsh, um, 40 days, 40 more days. It was, uh, many of my friends were asking me, oh, uh, don't go there. Like, what's about your neighbors? And I realized that I felt offended. Like when they were thinking that I was scared of my neighbors because uh, I, even though the information and misinformation, all the flow in, in the news channels was really against Armenians, I wouldn't think that our connection was less, uh, I mean, uh, strong than, um, uh, you know, the, the strength of media. So um, I think this is pretty political, but um, me not showing all those political discussions and conversations with Mat Fatma Teze was, um, I mean, consciously. I wanted everyone, whether Armenian or Turkish or Kurdish or whether being from Turkey or Armenia, um, you know, uh, to understand what is going on. And I could only show it on a personal level which is pretty political. Uh, I hope I did answer your question. If not, just we can keep on. Yeah, can you just also, what she said after she saw the film, because she didn't really- Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, I forgot it, sorry. And, uh, well, she watched it. Unfortunately, because of pandemic again, we couldn't watch it together, uh, but she watched it with her daughter and she was amazed. She was so happy. Uh, and, I mean, and I mean, you saw there was uh, there were these parts where she was speaking about Armenians living in Erzincan and uh, you know about Turkey, Armenia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. She watched it with her neighbors, with her niece uh, that lives uh, next building, 
and she was all like enthusiastic about this. She was so happy. She was telling everyone, you know what? Have you seen our documentary? And she kept on asking me, uh, will we, will this be screened on the Terete? And I was like, um, well, if they, if they want to, why not? But, you know, I cannot promise this. But I mean, she was, she expected this to be screened in Terete, <laughs> the national Turkish TV channel. And I was like, um, yeah, man, maybe other TV channels, but you know, if they come for this, of course, I would be happy to. I mean, this is the political uh, level she's at. I mean, she's not, uh, and this is good. She doesn't have the prejudice. She thinks that Terete would stream this and I'm happy for her <laughs> that she thinks this. I mean, I hope those days will, will come, but still it's not uh, uh, there yet, let's say. Uh, so she was really happy. Uh, there was the um, uh, gala of the, of the documentary uh, in frames of uh, women's um, directors festival here. Uh, uh, she was supposed to come, but again, it was this pandemic and also her husband was not really uh, feeling good. It was a big risk to take her like physically, you know, to watch it together. So I still hope it will uh, happen, but uh, we couldn't watch it together. So, but her reaction was really like uh, positive. And she, she, sa she said she sent it to all her uh, relatives. And I know this because whoever was coming like her, uh, sister-in-law, her brother-in-law, the families, everyone, they were like, they were just coming to the balcony to see me. <laughs> Every, everyone knew me. They were coming, oh, we know you. And that was already something. We speak about like a couple of dozens of people. <laughs> That's yeah, great. So, Marduy, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I, I got a little message. I think Ani Elmaldo has a question or a comment. I want to get in as many people as we can. I'm sorry, but I guess Isam was uh, trying to ask something before. So, uh, yeah, am I miss go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, but maybe after Annie. Okay, thank you. Just, uh, as I saw it, I just wanted I know to... I saw it too, but I, I got a message, so I'm oh. trying to go with the um, with the chronology. But Annie, are you there? Did you want to say something? Uh, hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. Hi, um, yeah, my name is Ani, and I'm originally from Kurtulush. It's funny how you're talking about it. We used to live on, um, um, Bilezik Chisokak. Anyways, um, we came here uh, when I was um, 15 years old, so now going on 31 years ago, and uh, we lived in an apartment complex where um, I think when I was there, uh, mostly Armenians, and but now of course it's pretty much almost Turkish people living in the complex. So we were uh, intermingled, going to each other's house, etc. When I was growing up, I didn't know about the genocide. I always knew there was something, but my family didn't talk about it. So after coming to the U.S., um, I didn't really know anybody Turkish until the last five, until the last ten years. So now I have a mix of Turkish friends as well as uh, Armenian friends from Turkey. And what I'm finding, my hairdresser is Turkish. I have a very good, um, I would consider a close friend, um, co-worker who we help each other out, um, but we do not, um, he's 10 years younger than me and we do not talk about anything about politics or genocide or anything like that. When um, the uh, genocide commemorations happen, uh, it was in the news, especially in Los Angeles area where Armenians were protesting and blocking the traffic and somebody brought that up and the subject of the genocide happened. And this friend of mine, he kind of left it off when the subject came off. Um, he is, um, he might be what you might call a white Turk, uh, I guess, quote unquote. I don't really use that term actually, but he was pretty much, um, he just believed what he saw in the news. And so I realized that during that conversation, though we kept it pretty short, I got really emotional. And it's really hard to have that dialogue with somebody, an Armenian and a Turk, if you get emotional and if you are like me where you kind of start tearing up, et cetera. I think it's important to have the dialogue, um, understanding that there's a risk of you uh, jeopardizing that friendship and that relationship you have when you take on that conversation. And also um, to basically without have that conversation without getting angry or emotional, which is hard to do, I believe. 
So uh, that's just my comment about the difficulty of the um, having a dialogue with your, whether it be your neighbors, whether it be your friends. Um, my mom's go, my mom has many Turkish friends. She goes for a walk with them. And she said during the entire Karabakh war, this recent one, nobody brought it up. They just kept it to the surface just so they can basically maintain their relationship and nobody gets upset. So that's my comment. I enjoyed the documentary very much. Fatma Tizi reminded me of my grandma a lot with her confidence, how she was saying that, look, look how, what a good job I'm doing with this video, etc. My grandma had that confidence in everything she did. So it was very enjoyable to watch. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you for your comment. I think you wanted to say something. Maybe yeah. I, I would like to something uh, regarding Ali's comment, if it's fine. I'm sorry, Ihsan. This was the third time. Sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Uh, I mean, I, uh, I understand this. I guess we should, uh, I should speak maybe a bit more about uh, this, uh, uh, the word genocide and uh, whether pronouncing it, speaking about it, like how it's, how it affects. Uh, uh, it, the documentary was not about me initially. It was just how it evolved and she wanted to ask me questions. She didn't want to be uh, only the one to be interviewed. So this is how it happens uh, that you see me as well in the documentary. It was not uh, the idea in the beginning. I'm happy it happened, but still. So, uh, but before that, I mean, uh, when she asked my story, uh, we spoke about this and my family, this is, I mean, literally the way I told her, uh, this is the way I, I, I speak about my family's uh, history story. So it's like they migrated, they fled uh, before the Armenian genocide and then, um, some parts of the family went to nowadays Azerbaijan and from which my family had to flee in uh, late 1988. So uh, the word genocide was there in the story, whether I was telling it to Fatma Teze or someone else. She never argued about this. And um, I'm sorry that, you know, your friends or your mom's friends were kept silent. I mean, there was not at least the case with me, let's say. I mean, all of my friends were showing really like huge solidarity and Fatma Teze herself, she never called me, like never. She never checked on me. She was checking on me, like, how are you? I, I, I cannot see you around. Like, do you need anything or whatever? I was not speaking about uh, the, 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 the war itself because she was not really following it up or she, she, she was escaping it, but she was literally showing that she was there for me. And uh, so this is why, uh, you know, I, I, I still don't keep those uh, like uh, being politically uh, active or uh, that much, um, uh, how to say, like mature, and, but being in solidarity with some of your neighbor, whether it's an Armenian or uh, Greek or Jewish, whatever. Uh, so I guess, yeah, it was, uh, I'm sorry for this. I mean, it was the case here as well with many people. But uh, I mean, I'm sure there are many people who would show solidarity as well, and who will? <laughs> I mean, it's a complicated situation. It was, it's still, so um, hopefully it will get better, let's say. Yeah, now I guess, Isan, I'm not gonna interrupt you. <laughs> hey, thank you. And uh, it's great to see you, Arduhi, again, and congratulations on your film. And thank you, Gonja, for putting this together again. So I think for those who are not familiar with the Turkish uh, community uh, from uh, the, 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 from at least from the near uh, past. It it's might a, I'm be... sorry, I'm sorry. Can you say just uh, something? Oh, sorry, sorry, this? sorry, I forget it. Mm -hmm. So I'm Ihsan and we moved in the Boston area. So we live in uh, Watertown. Uh, three years ago, almost four years actually, Armine made it a little earlier than me. So we came here for academic purpose of Armine and uh, we just decided to stay here up on the uh, things started to being upside down in Turkey. That's more or less the Vardu is, uh, how to say, the journey for Tur Istanbul. So we live in uh, Watertown and I'm doing like freelance thing, freelance uh, things. And I've been Im involved with many of dialogue projects within Turkish Armenian context. So 
I was telling that uh, for those who are not familiar with Turkish political sphere, it might not be easy to extract the, uh, the political uh, subliminal messages from the documentary. But for me, it's like very multi-layered political film. I could tell, uh, so one of the things that I can tell about is uh, how Kurtulish transformed throughout the last 50 years, let's say. How, uh, who were the, uh, the previous uh, residents of the neighborhood and who are replaced them now. So it's basically the minority groups, they would live in the area like Jews, Armenians, and the Greeks. But then starting from the uh, 1970s, uh, maybe late 60s, they, so the migration from the Eastern part of the Turkey started and uh, mostly the Kurds or Alevis who came to keep the janitorship positions in the buildings. And then they started to bring their own community. So you can even tell this transformation is reflected in the uh, documentary. You being an Armenian lady, trying to initiate a dialogue with a Turkish lady. I may have some reservation for that too, but that's another discussion. So my question is that, how those people are aware that what they are living on now, what kind of neighborhood it used to be, and because my experience, I was a big fan of Kurtulus and I would spend so much time there. Uh, some of them after some certain age would feel more confident to acknowledge something that happened in the past, not for those around the mid age, but for those upper mid age or like the early uh, 70s they would somehow feel like more confident to interact with the youngsters and to talk about uh, how was the neighborhood and the, what happened to their old neighbors. Uh, so what is your impression about that? How much Fatma Teyze is aware of like Kurtulus as a neighborhood and the, 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 the heritage of the Kurtulus, like the intellectual or not, not an intellectual, but in societal heritage of, uh, I completely understand the question and I completely respect what you're asking. In terms of other people who want to ask questions, I'd like to keep uh, the, and I won't argue to, uh, to answer you, but a little bit quickly because I want to make sure that the theme that we're talking about as far as dialogue is still there. Um, and so we don't, you know, go too far afield from that. But Farduhi, please do that. And I know Celine Sarian has some questions right after this. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Isma. It was really nice seeing you and Armine after a long time. And thanks for the great work you're doing. Um, yes, I mean, it, this film wouldn't have happened if it was not in Kurtulush, most probably. I mean, there are not many areas in here where you could have this dialogue, uh, not many districts, let's say. So Kurtulush is, I guess, um, um, the district that it would happen. Uh, she, how, how far she is aware of it? I think better than me, not from uh, what she read in the books, but uh, through her experience, because she has been living there for more than 40 years. Uh, and, uh, and this is something she has had like Armenian, Jewish, Greek neighbors, she shared with them and she has this human experience shared experience that is, uh, you know, telling her about the multicultural um, layers of Kurtulush. I'm not really sure whether she's aware of the, uh, of uh, what happened like in Kurtulush during pogroms, etc. I'm not really sure what, uh, I mean, how far she is to what, to what extent she's aware of it, but uh, I guess she's, she has more experience than me uh, just reading uh, this stuff from the books or from articles. I mean, this is at least, I mean, uh, this is, this is the reason she's, uh, we are able to, to have this uh, communication, let's say. Soline, can you unmute yourself and please ask your question? Um, yes. Uh, Fatima, do you want to answer? Uh, I see in the chat you want to answer further. I can ask after. 
Uh, answer what? Ha, huh, there is a. Oh yeah, yeah, there is a comment from Fatma. Yeah, I mean. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, and she she yielded back. So okay. Um, uh, Vatri, um, Fatima's uh, the, your your neighbors uh, um, like friendship towards Armenians or maybe like warmness towards Armenians. Um, I wanted to ask as uh, the you know Islamized Armenians are 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 grappling with their identity, um, especially with more DNA availability. Um, her friendship made me feel like, okay, people can come forward more. Um, can you talk on that? Uh, you know, uh, this question of identity, which is so complicated and um, is her warm, warmth and, and closeness um, uh, opening, like a sign of the doors opening almost of, of, of being more, um, some of these labels being able to be removed and and uh, people being uh, more accepting of each other and different identity hats. Does that make yeah. sense? Right, that's a circular question. Sorry, but does that make sense? I will. I will. I will try to answer your question. But if I didn't get it properly, just you know, interrupt me, please. Um, well, I mean, the we have all this. Um, uh, we have uh, our views uh, on identities, and we sometimes comment too much about identities. We put them into a frame, and uh, which has a certain black, like you know, uh, how you call it, frame. It's it's like it's uh, it's not fluid. It's just there, like with black. Mm -hmm. And then we think that identity, a certain identity, fits in that frame. I don't really think so. Uh, I mean, I think it's it's fluid. I'm not the one to decide what kind of identity she has. There were many people who commented on her identity, saying that she's most probably Alevite. That's why she's uh, she's uh, speaking about all of those stuff. That's why she's communicating with me. Well, I asked her. She said no. She was not Alevi. And the song that she's singing, they said it's a it's a Alevi song from uh, uh, um, Malatya, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, no, she learned it from from the uh, from the TV, and I believe this because when I gave her uh, this uh, re recorder, as she doesn't know how to read, I mean, I was like, "This is on, so please don't speak to your husband anything private. You know, just sing it in in a room, empty room." So then I heard it, and she forgot the words, and then she was playing this, uh, you know, on her phone to remember it, and then she was doing it over. So I really do believe that she learned this song from TV, whether it's an Alevi song or it's, it's a Turkish Sunni Muslim song. And, um, and that's what I like about Fatma Teze. She is not really uh, fitting into these uh, frames of um, identity that we create in our head, let's say. Uh, to what extent uh, I am an Armenian or to what extent she is a Sunni Islam Muslim uh, Fatma Teze. Uh, like this is, uh, this is, I don't know, I, I don't really, because I was criticized of not being a proper Armenian just because I moved in Turkey. I, I moved to Turkey. Well, I don't tend to believe this. I don't find this normal. And, uh, and people are being criticized for the, or judged for the identities that we impose on them. And I'm not gonna impose any identity on Fatma Teze. She's Fatma Teze the way she is. I, I don't really care whether she's, uh, she's praying, she's not praying, she's religious, she's not. She's herself, whatever she is. And I guess everyone is different and everyone is living this identity path differently. So I, I cannot put her or anyone else, you know, in, in, into this, like, let's say. I, I don't know whether if this was a round answer as well, <laughs> but I hope I, I did answer your question. Yes, um, thank you. Just, just something. Unless Fatma, this is how it's going to go. Uh, unless Fatma wants to go back and ask the question she had earlier, Oji Geretsian from the Bay Area, who was the founder of Opening the Mountain Dollar Group, has something to say. Fatma, would you like to interject? Uh, well, actually, more like a comment, so not, oh. not a question, because I had a little bit of. Yeah, first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Fatma Bulas from the Netherlands, The Hague. And I met Vardu in Switzerland Co, where we went with the Hague. Peace projects. Uh, Typhon Balchik is the initiator of 
this whole dialogue, dialogue in uh, Co. Uh, I don't know, I felt a little bit uncomfortable when Ehsan was uh, talking about uh, Istanbul, about Kurtulush, how it used to be, because in the Netherlands, me, myself, I'm, I'm a minority. So I, you know, my my mom is 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 an Azeri Turk. My father is Kurdish. My mom wears a hat scarf, and I have the feeling that most of the time, like the the white people in the Netherlands, Dutch people, also talk about the Turks that came in the seventies to the Netherlands. That they are part of um, that. How uh, the Netherlands used to be. So I don't know if it's that, and also, yeah, that was just my remark that it. it can be like I don't know, like who who uh, Istanbul uh, 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 who can claim it? I mean, cities change, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I don't know if you've seen this uh, this uh, Netflix series called uh, Ethos, which I really recommend, which shows the different layers in the society. But my question was actually, um, I mean, you have like different layers. Uh, within dialogue and uh, I think Vardu gave a great great answer on it about uh, yeah it's also weird to talk about Fatma Teza I have the same name by the way uh, while she's not here and uh, I used to be also in Istanbul and I also met her and she reminds me of my own aunties etc but uh, do does everybody have to have an opinion on this political situation uh, that is a bit like uh, what I'm struggling with. Often, like we have, when you start a dialogue, people want to know from you, like on which side of the uh, spectrum are you standing? And I think there shouldn't be, when you start a dialogue, you shouldn't have like, uh, how do you say it? Um, any rules, you know? I mean, respect should be there, but not like uh, where you stand in, because often when you get to know the other person, you, how you say it, you will uh, change in some way your perspective. So I was like wondering, like, uh, are there any um, rules or like play rules where you have a dialogue outside of this political, uh, 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 how do you say it, that it's all like uh, politicized? Was that a question, Fatma? I mean, the, yeah, the last- because I feel like you explained it like three times to other people. Uh, about Fatma Teze, and I feel like this about that it's uh, uh, like as if she has to, uh, uh, how would you say it, that she has to somehow find a solution on it, that she has to say, yeah, there had been a genocide in 1915. I don't think Fatma Teze is the right person for this. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. one thing. let me just in terms of time and how the format and what we're doing here, this is wonderful because I have a feeling we could go on talking for three hours. It is 108 and I want that people who have something to say to say it. So, for example, if you have some follow up thing, I can't quite come back right to you because, you know, if you have a second question or comment just because, you know, I want other people to have a say. So why do you please do answer if you have an answer to, to Fatma's question. I'm gonna to go to Ojik after that. And what I would like to um, people to remember is that please write down, if you want to publicize your email or your affiliation or whatever in the chat, because that means whether I'm here or not, you can get to talk to each other later on when this event is over. So that's my recommendation to all of you. Where do we go? Yeah, thank you, Fatma, and thank you, Ogonja, for the reminders. Um, well, uh, I guess dialogue is a mutual thing. So I don't think that it was Fatma Teze creating or me creating a dialogue with her, but it was mutual. And I got rid of my prejudices, like way maybe more than Fatma Teze did. Uh, so uh, then maybe we could go uh, and, I mean, reverse it and then think about me, like how I was thinking about a Turkish person, like, Oh, okay, me as an X person, I don't really refer to myself. Uh, but, uh, and I, I agree that we, um, we uh, dialogue is uh, something, I mean, if a person is there for dialogue, whether he's a denialist or not, whether uh, he or she is, a, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, whoever it is, it's like uh, whether they are uh, nationalists or not, we should be open. So I had both. Like I had both in my life and trust me, 
uh, facing um, a nationalist Armenian from uh, from Lebanon who would just accuse me of anything, anything, and who would be like, uh, at least it literally happened, like uh, I was taught how to shoot uh, in a dialogue project and meeting a denialist, a Turkish denialist, it's the same thing for me. So it's not only uh, that person who is denying uh, the G word is equals the person who is just uh, blindly nationalist not and not open to dialogue. But here is this uh, huge part. It's like uh, all those people change. This is what's so in coup uh, during these dialogue projects that continue and that are really amazing. Uh, not everyone is open for this, but once they are there, it changes in two days. I, I'm telling you, I was accused of uh, paying taxes in Turkey. I mean, they were not even thinking of what I am doing here, what kind of job I'm doing, what I'm working on, what kind of views I have. But she was just confident enough to say that I uh, am a traitor just because I moved to Turkey and I'm paying uh, taxes to Turkish government. Well, I find this like uh, uh, this equals for me with a with a genocide denial a denialist. So uh, this is like uh, we should look at, at, at two sides. And I am open to anyone. If they are willing to speak, to argue, to fight, it's fine. <laughs> because at the end, there is always a chance. I mean, change, whether they admit it or not. Uh, I hope, I, that, I mean, uh, I could explain myself, no, uh, you, my thoughts. You did a great job. Thank you. Oji, can you please? It's your turn. Hi, everybody. Thank you all so much for this uh, rich discussion. I. <clears throat> I wanted to, um, again, my name is Ojig and I'm uh, from the Bay Area, founder of the Opening the Mountain Dialogue Group. We've been uh, meeting since 2007 and it's a sustainable ongoing dialogue group, I'm proud to say. And um, I think what, like, I think it was Fatma who asked like, what are the rules of engagement? What are the criteria for um, dialogue. And for us and our group, it's more about the process than the outcome. And I think, or it's a tension between the process and the outcome. And we are, our ground rules include just being open to listening and sharing. When, um, you know, when I think about the basket, um, and thank you, Vardui, for that film. I did not grow up in an environment where I had any opportunities to interact with Turkish people. So for me, it was like um, the experience of hearing and learning about the history, going to Armenian schools, growing up in Los Angeles. It was like, I had a lot of fear. I carried a lot of fear because I thought that Turkish people hated me. Not, not because they knew me, but just because they, like did they, some Turks hated my ancestors and so we were made our way out. But I think the work of dialogue, the value of dialogue is having the courage to seek out opportunities for engagement, for getting to know the other, for humanizing the other. And um, I also thought I was, would be treated as disloyal to the Armenian community for reaching out to the Turkish community. And um, the, the word car bomb always like would come up, be conjured in my head. Like if, if, the, political, if the political parties find out I'm doing this work, one day there's gonna be a car bomb um, because of stuff that happened in Lebanon. I think there's also that history. So I, I also remember trying to start a group in Los Angeles and feeling like the community in LA was so entrenched. Like the Turks were like, I'll come, we'll come to the table if we can first have a meal and ha like have coffee, hash out, like get to know each other and then get to the harder subjects. And then the Armenian community was like, I'm not sitting down with a Turkish person unless I find out where they stand on the issue. And um, so both, both are require risk, both require safety, some uh, level of um, courage and feeling 
like the structure is set up for it to be okay to take these risks and to disagree and to have civil disagreements. Anyway, I appreciate you all and I thank you and I um, will stop there. Thank you. Um, what, did Apo have a question and did Hande have something to say? Second, I just wrote a I just wrote a long email because I don't think we have time for my questions and comments. Uh, I just saw my younger self in Warduhi when she was talking. Uh, I used to be a filmmaker. Uh, my focus was Greeks and Turks. I, I wrote a, a, a small uh, paragraph there. If anybody wants to uh, have a dialogue after this wonderful um, uh, discussion, um, my email is there. And um, thank you, everybody. I'll, I'll stop here so somebody else can uh, uh, ask a question. Thanks for your comments. Apo, if you have something to say, you need to unmute yourself. Did you? I wrote you. Did you unmute yourself? Can I say something? Um, mute? Oh, there yeah. we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry, I'm still a dinosaur. It's okay. Uh, thank you, Gonja. Thank you, Bartuhi. For what you guys are doing is wonderful. It's it's wonderful that we're still trying to help out humanity. My question to Vartui is: Do you find a social or ethical social ethical question? Is this something that only for Armenians and Turks, or is it a worldwide story that we're dealing with? Us as humanity, from day one, we haven't stopped killing each other. We're still denying our mistakes. We're not learning from our past. We're repeating ourselves. Yes, we have gone to the moon, but we're still killing each other. Where is our ethics? Where are our social ethics? I wonder, what's the source behind that? What's the source behind that? Thank you for putting out that extremely important question, uh, especially in light of what has been happening in the US, in, in Turkey, what's been happening lately. Um, that's something that we have to ponder a lot about. Right now, I think Burju Tung wanted to say something. You have to unmute yourself. Thank you, Gonja, for um, having all of us here. Uh, I wanted to very, um, <laughs> well, I, I really want to comment to um, Apo just very quickly, you know, I. I've been teaching um, at UC Berkeley about violence just so I could have learned better about why is it that we are this way in terms of our human behavior. And, um, and it's very complicated and sometimes um, quite depressing when you see the historical sort of trajectory of humanity. Um, so I, I really feel that question. And um, I wanted to uh, follow up with Ojig's um, when she was talking about opening the mountain and sort of how our dialogue group has been going on for so long. Um, I wanted to emphasize that we, when we get together, one of the ground rules that we do have is to speak from our personal experiences. And um, to really ground everything with our immediate personal experiences to have that open communication between different members. And, um, and I feel that that has been very successful in sort of keeping the dialogue going on for an extremely long time. Um, and um, on another note, I wanted to comment to uh, Varduhi about her film and I, I, I was so touched by it, but 
and and I felt so much frustration with Fatma Teze that she couldn't say your name. Uh, and you closed it with that. You, you closed it with her still saying, oh, I can't really pronounce your name. And I personally felt extremely frustrated and upset because, um, and, it, and it also sort of shows this uh, Turkish privilege, narrow uh, worldview, even though this, you know, it comes from this, we come supposedly uh, from a historically multi-ethnic community nation, but no one can pronounce a name that's not Turkish. People are, have, have a hard time, or they always say, oh, what is that name from? You know, there, there's an assumption of everyone having have to be Turkish. And um, I, I don't know, it's, it's funny that you said in the earlier in the discussion that, that you didn't take that personally because of her background, but for me, I took it personally as I was watching it. Thank you, Burju. Thank you for your uh, comments. I will, I will get back to that, but trust me, Fatma Teze, is not the only person who is mispronouncing my name. It's been seven years, trust me. Many academics, scholars, journalists, friends, they still mispronounce my name. So that's, I guess this is, this is a general thing. And uh, I, I mean, I wouldn't want you to be frustrated by this, <laughs> let's say. Uh, I will go back to uh, Mr. Abraham's uh, question or remark. Um, well, um, as I said before, it was uh, it was on purpose that this is not a um, not to put all these political discussions, but keeping keep it on a, a social and personal level, because uh, someone in uh, unfortunately and really unfortunately the Armenian genocide or events before or after this violence present, uh, we are not the only ones living this. There are many uh, conflicts in the world, uh, even harsher ones maybe uh, nowadays. And uh, I guess everyone, uh, I mean, I couldn't claim that I can uh, really personally uh, feel it or uh, connect, but if, if it's a personal story, then it's, uh, there is a higher possibility that uh, one would understand what is going on. And I guess uh, in the, throughout the documentary, it's, uh, uh, it is obvious that there is something, if, if there is someone from, uh, from Brazil who has no clue about Turkish-Armenian relationship or the past or uh, genocide, if they watch it, at the end, they will understand that there is something that was in there. Uh, there is something that we speak about. And uh, uh, on the personal level, there is this dialogue and there is, a, um, there is um, a reason for this to happen. And I wanted this to be on personal level because people can refer to this. While it's really hard, no matter how many books uh, you, you read or watch, at least from my experience, to relate something that is, um, that is not personal and uh, you cannot somehow connect yourself in there. So that was the reason it was, it was personal. And, uh, yeah, and um, so it was, I mean, this social political aspect, I mean, it was global just because it was personal and uh, it was on purpose. I mean, uh, I, I knew I would get criti uh, critics, I mean, I mean uh, people would criticize me, uh, but it was on purpose. <laughs> I mean, we could speak about the genocide as well, but that was not my, uh, my purpose while shooting. I didn't want to trigger her I am not frustrated that she's not able to pronounce my name, as I uh, told you in the beginning. Now I realize more why she was not able. And um, coming to Burju's uh, remarks and, and um, comments and question, uh, yes, uh, she. I, I don't see her as a privileged uh, uh, part of the society. She's definitely not, whether be it uh, economically or uh, we never know whether she's one of those uh, many people who has to uh, hide their real identity or what is real, okay, in general, uh, let's, I'm not going to discuss this, but her identity, 
and pretend to be someone else. I, I, would, I will never learn this because whatever she says about her identity, this is what I have and this is what I'm going to, uh, to uh, accept. Uh, but I don't see her as, as, a, as a privileged uh, part of the society. And there are many reasons. She is a woman. Uh, she is, uh, and she suffered a lot just because she was a woman in, in, in that area. She doesn't know how to read just because she was a woman. And, uh, and also economic, uh, economically, I mean, I couldn't put her in a privileged part. And I, I think it's really important in Turkey, I mean, in the context of Turkey. So yeah, I'm not frustrated. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't love you to be frustrated. So please don't. Uh, as I told you, there are many people who mispronounce my name, maybe not Melissa, but in this case, at least, uh, this is the name of someone she really loved. Uh, so it's good. Um, Typhoon has a question or a comment. Please unmute yourself and tell us just a few things about yourself. Yes, hi everybody. My name is Typhoon Balcik. Um, I'm from Amsterdam and I'm the coordinator of the Turkish Kurdish Armenian Dialogue Group at the Hague Peace Projects. Uh, we started after the war broke out between uh, Turkey and the PKK in 2015 and uh, after that we yeah we right away we also included yeah the armenians the armenian question the armenian genocide um yes i'm involved since 2015 and i'm also a historian i wrote my thesis about the armenian genocide um this whole discussion about political dialogue and yeah, dialogue between yeah, normal people um it triggers me because um, it is something I'm also frustrated about. Uh, it is the 14th anniversary of the uh, murder of uh, Han Ding, and this is the time we come together. But uh, in the meantime, there is no contact. We are a segregated society. And the next time it's 24 April that we come together again as people who are sometimes professionally involved in this uh, question. Um, and I'm also included in this, yeah, system. Um, and um, yeah, it is something we have to do with normal society or whether you call it privileged or not. If they do not come to us, we have to go to them. Um, and um, it is really a, a frustrating thing to, um, yeah, be involved in such a huge trauma from the past. And, uh, and there should also be political dialogue because we, see, we saw at Karabakh what happens if we accept the status quo as it is. Uh, it leads to murder, it leads to uh, a lot of uh, violence. And um, yeah, so I would just want to say that I'm also frustrated at this uh, point and that we should do something uh, else. And if people can trigger something like Varduhi uh, to do something else. And also I think she is laying the groundwork for something we have to do much more. And that's come together and talk uh, yeah, with each other like Ram Dink also said. Um, yeah, that was also yeah my comments, uh, and also maybe just my frustration about yeah uh, the whole Turkish Armenian dialogue process, which is sometimes exist and sometimes totally not. Thank you, thank you, Typhoon. Um, I mean, we can keep going till two o'clock if that's with you. I can come back if there's no new questions. I'm just quickly checking. Um, I saw. Some Go ahead. Who, who yeah, is the art? I, I was a comment. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Go, please. There was a delay. So go ahead. Is it my turn? Yes, Artin, please. Please, let's hear from you. Tell us <coughs> a few things, please. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. I'm Artin Gönju, uh, cousin of uh, Herman and uh, Laura Prutian, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I have not yet seen uh, your work, Vartuhi. Uh, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Is it Vartuhi or Varduhi? Yes, it is Vartuhi, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> How, 
how uh, whether or not we pronounce a name, I suppose it depends on where you come from and which dialect of the language you speak. Uh, even as Armenians, we do not always speak the uh, same dialect. So there will be variations and I'm pleased that uh, you are not uh, frustrated with uh, Fatma Teze's uh, uh, miss or different pronunciation of your name. I would like to emphasize uh, one point. Uh, it came up, uh, Fatma Blas brought it up and Vardui uh, reinforced it. Um, I think it is very important as to where we situate ourselves in addressing uh, complex matters. When we talk about uh, Turkish-Armenian relationships, uh, it is very important to keep in mind that uh, this issue has so many different layers. Uh, recently, it has become even more complex uh, because of the conflict between Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, talking about Turkish-Armenian relationships involves, uh, of course, genocide, but it goes beyond that. Even during the Republic times, there have been many complex issues and how we look at them is very important. I think as we address these complex issues, if we define the parameters of our conversation or our own dialogue, the conversation will become a bit more possible. It is very easy for the dialogue to lose its boundaries. And when the boundaries are lost, or unnecessarily stretched to go beyond the reference of the conversation, it is very difficult. Even with your very close friends, I have very dear friends, Muslim Turkish friends, with whom I have significant difficulty in talking about, for example, the genocide as a historical fact. But when I tell them about my family's history as lived experience, they listened to me with a great deal of empathy. And in fact, so many of them burst into tears as I listened to my grandmothers on both sides stories. I think Burju touched on this and I would like to reinforce this also. This is a small group obviously, and this is my first time and I have recently begun to talk about these issues. And I think it is so much easier and more humanly possible in view of these emerging very significant trends in social sciences, such as intersectionality to address all these issues. For me, for example, to talk about Turkish-Armenian relations is a very complex problem because I consider myself both. I was born and raised in Ankara, Turkey. There was no Armenian church. There was no Armenian school. I got actually my religious education for whatever it was worth in the Roman Catholic church over there. And at home, the kind of Armenian that my family spoke, in fact, disappeared unfortunately over the years. But that was Armenian that the adults spoke. They didn't speak to us in Armenian because they didn't want us to reveal our Armenian nature when we went out to the streets or to the school. I think it is very important uh, to keep these in mind. One of you also, Ovar Dui said this, often I felt because of these layered nature of my identity, I have always felt so alienated. I am never Armenian enough for the Armenians and I am never Turkish enough for the Turks. In Turkish, we say more or less meaning for those who don't speak Turkish uh, uh, lost between two different mosques, uh, not knowing which one to go to. Sometimes this becomes your elegance if you internalize this and 
don't deny it and use it. And yet sometimes it could be utterly destructive because you don't know how to speak and how to talk about yourself. In that spirit, I uh, just wanted to say this. As a psychologist, this is a very significant issue for me. And that it, in some way, like uh, uh, Solin, I think, said this, or Ojik did too, process is very important. Actually, process is the product. There is no identified specific product in life. Product is something that emerges as we speak. So in that spirit, I wanted to thank uh, my cousins, Herman and Flora, and as the organizer of this group uh, to Gonja, I and say thank you. Shachino uh, regalem, çok teşekkür ederim. And thank you because it is only through these sorts of conversations, I think, we sort of justify who we are and know that, in fact, we are there and there are other voices like ours. So, Gonja, if you don't invite me to the next one, then you're going to be in the dog's house. Oh. Right. Thank you for that warning. Uh, Lana Ekmekcioğlu, Professor Ekmekcioğlu, she wants to say something quickly right before Laura. Well, Lana. Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I am a, a historian working at MIT, and I worked on history. I am an Armenian from Turkey, and I worked on the history of Armenians in Turkey in the aftermath of the genocide. Um, just very quick. I can say many, many things, as some of you know, uh, but I find it interesting and noteworthy that Vartuhi, whose work, the documentary, I loved. And I shared on Facebook, I think thanks to which Gonja actually got in touch with Vartuhi, even though they knew each other from before. I appreciate it. But the interesting thing for me right now is Vartuhi, this conflicting um, approach to the name issue, right? Be as Burju mentioned, oh, I think it was Burju, I also felt like the film ended with, if not, and it's not, it's resentment, right? That this woman with whom they, you are sharing so much is not just, mis, not, not just mispronouncing the name. It's not a mispronouncing. It's like a totally different name that stands for actually in his like, Turkish context, it is the white Turk name, right? Like Melissa. Like of all names, it is Melissa because she had this Melissa. It also reminds me late, recently when I watched uh, Ethos, uh, there was a Melissa there, right? Like the, the one who is doing this, this, um, this disease for the total, for the, uh, for the general public, let's say. Anyways, but now Vartu is saying that she didn't mean it that way or mi we misread it, right? Which I read as, I mean, she, she's the author, she can change her mind or maybe it's memory, we retrospectively reconstruct our memory, uh, it is also valid. But I also see that Vartui is going Turkish Armenian. I think she's going native. Like all these um, comments about, because when we say dialogue, it's really important, right? When, where you stand from, a Turkish Armenian will in, involve in a dialogue with a Turkish person from a very different standpoint than a an Armenian who was kicked out, Lebanese Armenian, or Armenian from Armenia. But I see that this transition of this Turkish Armenian selectiveness, when you, when you deal with a Turk who you know as a whole person, as a good person, right? But you can ignore some parts of it. And then just so that you can highlight the, the relatability, the personness of your neighbor with whom you have to compromise, as Varsi said, the basis of neighborliness is you have to give something so that you can take something, you can coexist based on some, uh, you have to have some ground rules of agreement, right? So I, I just think that it is worth, like, and also the name, one last thing, name. I mean, right, we are talking about the G word, the unutterability of it for some of us, the 
saying it is such a rite of passage for the rest of us. Once I said it, I felt so good. I remember my first time saying it in public in the United States, not in Turkey. I was 21 at the time here. So, and that this, she doesn't have to say your name, but she recognizes you and your suffering is also resonates with me with Vartu, uh, Vartu's comments of like during the war, she didn't talk about the war, but she was there. She, she asked how I was, she showed solidarity. I know that she was there, right? Like the standing, the, the, the absence of the name and how, how it can be interpreted very differently depending on where you are, which also says something in my mind about the dialogue and the evolution of one per person's standpoint, you know? Because it changes as we as we grow up, or change if we, depending on the location that we are at. Thank you, thank you, Lana. Um, Laura, please go, and then Aisha Nur wants to say something. Laura, unmute yourself. Sorry. Okay. okay. Uh, actually, I that was me who was raising the hand. Please, oh great. Hi, uh, Ganja. I think good to see you, Hello. and many of you who I've seen before. Uh, my name is Herman Purutian. Herman Purutian, I was born in uh, Istanbul, but I've been in this country for, I don't know, uh, a lot of years now, 40 plus. Um, and uh, I met Gonja through a dialogue years, years, years ago, and we became good friends. And uh, Gonja, I was just uh, remembering that one of those dialogues was scheduled to start a few weeks after Hiran Think was assassinated. Exactly around. February and around February and I think there was a discussion of you know should this go on could we still come together could we still you know have this dialogue and it, and it did go on and we had the dialogue um, and um, I, I guess my point is that I've been involved in dialogue since but my view has been evolving on the value of the dialogues quite honestly and not to uh, you know throw water on the fire or anything like this but particularly with what just happened in Karabakh and in Armenia. And um, so then I'm seeing, starting to see the dialogue at different layers of what it means to people who are participating. And at one level, when I was talking to, uh, you know, Turkish colleagues in the dialogue, I could say or discuss genocide that I had never been able to do in a different context in Turkey all along and release my frustration, if you will, um, you know, express my views and family stories, et cetera. And, and for the moment that really made me feel good. But I'm realizing that to think that that's necessarily going to have a big impact society-wide, uh, I'm questioning that because after all of that and after Hrant, you know, hundreds of thousands of Turks coming out on the streets and saying, we're all Armenians and we're all Hurant. And, you know, 20 or 15 years later to actually be attacked by the same country and to, you know, experience that, I'm thinking, so where is really the value of that? And me as, you know, having limited resources of time and energy you know, do I continue to do that to think that I'm going to make a difference? Or quite honestly, do I focus on those who are, you know, wounded and, and, and suffering and, you know, displaced right now? Um, and, and, you know, so that's kind of where I am. It's not a question. I, it's not, I, I, you know, I wanted to express sort of what I'm thinking right now great to obviously have the conversations, good to have personal relationship, uh, good to see Kurtulish where my uncle used to live uh, and all of that. Uh, but then, <clears throat> you know, the, the reality hits. And then I ask myself, you know, where is really the most important thing that I could focus on right now? Uh, so I'm, I don't have an answer, but I wanted to just express where I am, where my uh, thoughts are. And, and can I just add something, Gonja, quickly? That said, between us, we're having these dialogues. So this is, uh, you know, for me, generating, like sort of a, elevating how we think differently and together. But I'm also thinking about my whiteness in the US and uh, cur my courage and to what extent I can think in my head that I'm a really good person. Uh, but 
still not do anything about it. So um, it sort of has two sides for me, but that's all. Thank you, Laura. Um, I want to just have so, as, as many of you as possible. Aisha Noor, and then I think Elise has something. Let's see if we can fit it all in. Aisha Noor, please unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Aisha Noor. I am uh, a historical anthropologist at University of Amsterdam. I am currently finishing my PhD project I'm in my final year. Um, I know where to he from years back where we studied at Bilge University together. And um, as a sort of a comment, um, I wanna pick up the debate where Burdu and Lerna left about Fatma Teze not being able to pronounce Vart's name. Um, I have a similar experience um, in my field work where I conduct in Armenia. Um, I speak Armenian, uh, though not very fluently as a native person. Uh, I'm of Turkish background. I've learned the language later on. And um, my project is um, um, to understand the type of post-imperial nostalgia among the ex-Ottoman Armenians and their descendants in Armenia. So uh, I go to Armenia. I lived in Armenia uh, for the sake of field work. And my experience is exactly the same uh, with my respondents. Um, after we get closer, you know, uh, me doing ethnography in their homes or we do activities together, they always change my name to an Armenian name. So I became Anna for most people or uh, Ashken for a woman who came from um, the Karabakh re region, but originated from Mush. So when I saw that the the scene, you know, Fatma Teze not being able to pronounce, uh, and instead like going to some somewhere familiar with Vartuhi uh, by simply naming her Melissa, I felt really emotional in the first place because I also tended to, you know interpret this in my mind, maybe they want me to be Armenian, maybe they want to convert me, etc. Um, and, and, and I felt like kind of disturbed by that. Um, but then in the end, comparing these cases and also talking to other friends who have been in the field and who have also um, had issues of intimacy, I see this as a case of intimacy, uh, familiarity and unfamiliarity, and simply, um, you know, this for me is not being able to say a, a, a name that is originating from Arabic. Um, and it simply feels better to say Ashken. Um, that way they embrace you better when you, know, you, you feel, they feel you're one of them. Um, and and I, I believe this is my own interpretation. Uh, Melissa was a way uh, for Fatma Teza to familiarize. Uh, get rid of the uncanny uh, feeling um, whenever she spent time with Vartui. Thank you. Thank you. Elise, did you want to jump in, please? Elise? Oh, Can yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, yeah, and so it's um, it's interesting, this this conversation. Just quickly, you're from the Bay Area. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, very long story, but uh, I was... I left the Bay Area just before COVID hit. I was about to be spending some months in Armenia and also in, in Turkey. And so that did not happen. And now I'm in the Midwest, so it's complicated. Um, but uh, so yes, I'm a member of the um, Opening the Mountain group, uh, not for so long, um, just a, a couple of years or so. And um, it's very interesting talking about the the nuances of names. I, I'm, 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 I'm noticing how much it's resonating with me um, as different people have shared about the, the beautiful film and the tensions that came up um, and the different ways each person uh, was relating with the, the name um, issue. And so my name is Elise, <laughs> but the English transliteration of my name never conveys this um, to most people. 
and it's a it's a common immigrant thing in the U.S. Uh, where I grew up. Um, but uh, but I'm learning to soften that uh, Armenians pronounce it differently depending on where people are from. So there's that as well. Um, one of the one of the things I wanted to mention is that um, my first time in Turkey, which was in 2019, I stayed in Kurtulus and uh, so it was really lovely to watch the film and uh, deepen my understanding of the neighborhood, which was limited just based on what I had talked with um, when I was, uh, based on what people had told me when I was there. And, um, but I felt, I, I remember feeling pretty, like more comfortable there than in other neighborhoods. Um, and yet uh, something Ojig mentioned and, and, and other people too around um, engagement with the other, um, I, I hardly had any um, human Turkish presence in my life for many years. The first time I remember meeting someone who identified themselves as Turkish, I was in, internally um, like, waves of terror came over me it really surprised me and um so i've been trying to kind of examine that ever since and um in other work i've done working with folks living on the street in san francisco and going up against um very inhumane policies coming out of city hall around all of that uh there's this continual work of kind of asking what still connects me and what still separates me. And so I apply that, of course, also to relations between Armenians and Turks. And, um, and yet I, I felt like I was handling that okay and dealing with um, whatever discomfort arose in me. Um, but the, the war in Artsakh and Nagorno-Karabakh, like, really broke down a lot of the thoughts that I had had. I, I, I rec I had, I've had to confront that I had a lot of naivete. I was holding on to some ideals that I wanted to be true. And um, what I, oh, I'm, I'm having to recognize that within myself, I'm not able to have I'm not able to be a part of dialogue without it actually being dialogue, without like without some kind of basis for the conversation. Uh, Flora mentioned the notion of critical consciousness. Um, for me, the conversations I had with um, with some Turkish folks during the the recent um, violence, the highly asymmetrical violence in in Artsakh. Um, and the media wars around it made me realize I'm not at a place where I can just withstand all of that and then have kind of more surface level conversations with, with even the most beautiful um, people um, because it was so painful to me to be confronting the silence everywhere. Um, and so someone else spoke about the just kind of recognizing where we we are maybe individually and collectively and being real about that and I, I I want to be more realistic with myself um and not keep trying to stretch farther than I can go um and so just to wrap all that up I want to say I really appreciate this conversation there's been so much nuance so much like beautiful different colors of, of perspective and stories and um and is very meaningful to me to be a part of this today. So that's just my, my comment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I think this is a place where um, I'd like to say a few things, especially in light of what we just heard from Elise. I, I do thank all of you, uh, but I especially thank those of you um, Armenians who have had some apprehension or ambivalence towards having a dialogue at this point in time. And I know some of you have had that. So I thank you for coming out and be part of it because I certainly do understand where maybe you are questioning why all of a sudden because of this, the war just that just happened, 
encouraged by the government of Turkey. Um, why is it that you didn't hear any more comments or something from your Turkish friends or otherwise? So I do uh, thank all of you for showing up and coming here. I thank all of you for coming here at this hour and sticking with this for almost two hours. I thank Varduhi for making that, not Vartoni, not uh, for making that beautiful film. I thank Lerna, yes, one of the few times I'm gonna say something good about Facebook. I did see Varduhi's film on Lerna's posting. Thank you, Lerna, for putting it there. I usually don't get my ideas from Facebook, but uh, this one did catch my eye because it was beautiful. So I thank all of you. Um, and I do want to go back to the theme of why I wanted to do this dialogue. Yes, Herman and I met each other way back in 2006 when I was part of a reconciliation effort that I don't think it was completely independent or grassroots. Um, however, we did because it was held at Harvard and I think there was some interjection from public diplomacy on the part of the Turkish government at the time. And I'm not going to get into it too much. Um, when Hiram Fink was assassinated, it left an indelible and forever um, impression upon me. Um, and I started to read everything that I could put my hands on by him or about him. So thank you for sharing this day with me because um, it meant a lot to me that you actually all showed up and did have a lot of amazing deep thoughts that you shared. Um, unless Farduhi wants to say something at the very end, I'm going to close it and I'm going to thank all of you a lot. Yeah, I, I, I said I would like to say something, but that because I had a lot of remarks, I couldn't speak uh, like about what Lerna said. But after what you said, I guess it's better if we just, uh, you know, finish it for now and I hope we will have uh, more time to speak about um, all of these topics because it's uh, really multi-layered, it's complicated, and of course, two hours uh, is not enough. Uh, even a documentary or two and a half years spent uh, together as neighbors is not enough. So it continues. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a living process. It's a life process. Uh, let us not forget this. And no matter what kind of, uh, no matter like um, whether there is war, there is violence, there are states who are still against each other. Uh, I hope we will be able to keep this and uh, on a personal level. <laughs> so at least, which is, which is political again. And, um, and um, yeah, I guess uh, that was the reason, uh, one of the many reasons why, why all the people of Turkey and not only Armenians appreciated what I think did. And um, everyone was there, unfortunately, after his death, of course. Uh, thank you, Gonja, for organizing this. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming. It was really nice to have you all and all these discussions. Um, I hope I could answer all of your questions. And uh, it was from the point where I stand being an Armenian from Armenia and most probably not having all the traumas that many of you carry, uh, whether being Turkish or Armenian. But, well, this is where I stand, uh, or I mean, this is the point where I could manage to come, uh, let's say. Um, so thank you everyone for your contribution and uh, hope we will have other uh, chances to, to speak and uh, to speak up because it really heals. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and Binna says bye as well. I mean, as, as a character from, uh, from the documentary who doesn't miss anything. Hadi Binnas. Well, ours was Minnoş. <laughs> Unfortunately, Minnoş. she passed away in Istanbul. <laughs> and now we live in the US and we have a cat here who moved with us to the United States, back to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she doesn't miss anything. So, okay. <laughs> I see. We yeah, can she, see that yeah, she's she look, been very happy. <laughs> she looks. She looks very much like Minnoş. <laughs> <laughs> bye to you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Everybody, thank you. Minnoş. <laughs> <laughs>